Good day everyone and welcome to our last topic for the midterms. Every year, 10 million people fall ill with tuberculosis or the so-called TB despite being a preventable and curable disease. 1.5 million people die from TB each year, so making it the world's top infectious killer. TB is the leading cause of death of people with HIV and also a major contributor to antimicrobial resistance. Most of the people who fall ill with TB uh, live in low- and middle-income countries, but TB is present all over the world. About of all people with TB can be found in eight countries such as Bangladesh, China, India, Indonesia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Philippines, and South Africa. About one quarter of the world's population is estimated to be infected by TB bacteria. Only 5-15% to of these people will fall ill with active TB disease. So the rest have TB infection but are not ill and cannot transmit the disease. So both TB infection and disease are curable using antibiotics. So the learning outcomes for this lesson. So at the end of year level 3, students should be able to identify the different mycobacterium species, their general properties, virulence factors, Spectrum of the disease, explain the pathogenesis of the diseases caused by mycobacterium species, and differentiate the tests used to identify mycobacterium species with emphasis on the principles in positive or negative results. So for general characteristics, the organisms that belong to the genus mycobacterium are aerobic, although some may grow in reduced oxygen concentrations. They are also non-spore forming except for Mycobacterium marinum, non-motil, very thin, slightly curved or straight rods, usually 0.2 to 0.6 uh, or 1 to 10 millimeters in size, and then some species may display a branching morphology. Mycobacterium is the only genus in the Mycobacteria CA family, um, Actinomyces thales order, and then Actinomyces class. So the genera are closely related to Mycobacterium. It includes Nocardia, Rhodococcus, Chucamorella, and Gordonia. Mycobacterium species have an unusual cell wall structure. So the cell wall contains N-glycolyl muramic acid instead of N-acetyl muramic acid. And it has a very high lipid content, so which creates a hydrophobic permeability barrier. So because of this cell wall structure, Mycobacteria are difficult to stain with commonly used basic aniline dyes such as those used in gram staining. Although these organisms cannot be readily gram stained, they generally are considered gram positive. However, they resist the colorization with acidified alcohol or 3% hydrochloric acid after prolonged application of a basic fusion dye or with heating of this dye after its application. This important property of mycobacteria, which derives from their cell wall structure, is referred to as acid fastness. This characteristic distinguishes mycobacteria from other genera. So most pathogenic species of the family Mycobacteria CA uh, requires 2 to 6 weeks of incubation. Most are slow growers except for our Mycobacterium fortuitum chelonei, uh, which grows uh, at least three days on a modified Maconchi agar. And then we also have our Mycobacterium leprae, in which it fails to grow in vitro using your agarose medium. Tuberculosis, or the infamous TB, is caused by a bacterium called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It is also known as your coach bacillus or tubercal bacilli. So, MTB was first described by Sir Robert Koch in the year 1882. <laughs> So the bacteria usually attacks the lungs, and but uh, TB bacteria can attack any part of the body such as the kidney, spine, and brain. Not everyone infected with TB bacteria becomes sick. As a result, two TB-related conditions exist. So we have the latent TB infection or the LTBI and then TB disease. If not treated properly, TB disease can be fatal. Now let's proceed to the virulence factors of our Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So it is under your Mycobacterium uh, group or Mycobacterium species. So we have the mycoside in which it is a mycolic acid bound to a carbohydrate. We also have our 
chord factor in which the function of this chord factor it releases tumor necrosis factor resulting in the rapid weight loss of our patient so that is why uh, if there are uh, persons infected with this uh, bacteria causing the infection TB infection so they are thin in uh, physical appearance and we also have the sulfatides so the function of this virulence factor is to inhibit the phagosome from fusing with the lysosome that contains bactericidal enzymes. And lastly, we have this WAXD in which the function, uh, it will act as an adjuvant. An adjuvant means it enhances an antibody formation against an antigen. So it will activate the protective cellular immune system of our body. Now let's proceed to the disease itself. So tuberculosis. It is a disease of the respiratory tract or the pulmonary tract. So TB bacteria spread through the air from person to person by inhalation of droplet nuclei. So droplet nuclei containing the organism. So infectious aerosols, usually 1 to 5 micrometers in size, are produced when people with pulmonary tuberculosis uh, cough, sneeze, speak, or sing. Infectious aerosols may also be produced by manipulation of lesions or processing of clinical specimens in the laboratory. Droplets are so small that air currents keep them uh, airborne for long periods once inhaled. So they are small enough to reach the lungs alveoli. So when a person breeds in TB bacteria, the bacteria can settle in the lungs and begin to grow. So from there, they can move through the blood to other parts of the body such as the kidney, spine, and brain. TB disease in the lungs or throat can be infectious. This means that the bacteria can spread to other people. So TB in other parts of the body, such as kidney or spine, is usually not infectious. With pulmonary TB being the most common form of disease, so the chest radiograph is useful for diagnosis of TB disease. Chest abnormalities can suggest pulmonary TB disease. So a posterior anterior radiograph of the chest is the standard view used for the detection of TB-related chest abnormalities. So in some cases, especially in children, a lateral view may be helpful. In pulmonary TB disease, uh, radiographic abnormalities are often seen in the apical and posterior segments of the upper lobe in, or in the superior segments of the lower lobe. However, lesions may appear anywhere in the lungs and may differ in size. Uh, they also differ, differ in shape, then density, and cavitation especially in HIV-infected and other immunosuppressed persons. Radiographic abnormalities in children tend to be minimal with a greater likelihood of uh, lymph adenopathy more easily diagnosed on the lateral film. So mixed nodular and fibrotic lesions may contain slowly multiplying tubercle bacilli and have the potential for progression to TB disease. Next, we are going to discuss about primary tuberculosis or primary TB. It is the infection that occurs in a person with insufficient immunity to localize and control MTB in granulomas. So it can produce a spectrum of clinical disease states uh, ranging from disseminated TB in persons with AIDS, meningitis, miliary tuberculosis, and probably extrapulmonary granulomas. So it, is, uh, it typically occurs in the very young, immunologically naive, very old, or immunosuppressed persons. The infection can disseminate via lymphatics or the bloodstream to lymph nodes and diverse other organs. In immunocompetent people, the infection is controlled in weeks and the lesions heal. heal and then uh, primary TB produces systemic immunity that effectively protects the entire body from the disseminated infection. This immunity has been extensively studied and has become the central dogma of protective immunity mediated by macrophages or macrophages granulomas and the production of IFN gamma or interferon gamma by our CD4 plus T cells. And then BCG replicates primary TB sufficiently to protect from disseminated TB and meningitis but not from post-primary TB. Maintenance of protection depends on remaining immunocompetent uh, persons. And then lesions of primary TB can recure whenever uh, immunosuppression reduces systemic T cell mediated immunity. And uh, granulomas or a hard tubercle uh, form in the lung from the lymphocytes so the macrophages and cellular pathology including giant cell formation or cellular fusion displaying multiple nuclei. If the mycobacterium antigen concentration is high, the hypersensitivity reaction may result in tissue necrosis. 
caused by enzymes released from the macrophages. In this case, no granuloma forms and a solid or semi-solid uh, caseous material is left at the primary lesion site. So in some patients infected with primary active tuberculosis, the disease may spread via the lymph system or hematogenously leading to meningeal or miliary or disseminated tuberculosis. So the, this most often occurs in patients with depressed or ineffective cellular immunity. We also have the so-called POTS disease. So POTS disease is the most dangerous form of mucoskeletal tuberculosis because it can cause uh, bone destruction, deformity, and paraplegia. POTS disease most commonly involves uh, the thoracic and lumbosacral spine. So POTS disease and miliary tuberculosis are diseases associated with uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis when it spreads into the other parts of the body or other organs. So while miliary tuberculosis on the other hand is a potentially fatal form of the disseminated disease due to the hematogenous spread of tubercal bacilli to the lungs and other organs. So it results in the formation of uh, millet seed size, usually 1 to 2 millimeters in size of a tuberculous foci. Now let's proceed to the treatment. So after discussing the disease itself and the pathogenesis, not everyone infected with TB bacteria becomes sick. So as a result, two TB-related conditions exist. So we had the latent TB infection and TB disease, as mentioned earlier. So both latent uh, TB infection and TB disease can be treated. So without treatment, latent TB infection can progress to TB disease. If not uh, treated properly, then TB disease can be fatal. So TB disease is curable. It is treated by standard uh, six-month course of four antibiotics or you, sometimes five. So common drugs include, so please remember our mnemonics RIPES. So we have your R for rifam rifampicin, I for isoniazid, uh, P for pyrazinamide, E for etambutol, and then S is our streptomycin. And we also have our second line agents of our drugs. So we have your etionamide, capriomycin, ciprofloxacin, cycloserine, refabutin, ofloxacin, and your canamycin. So in some cases, uh, the TB bacteria does not respond to the standard drugs, which was mentioned uh, in the previous slide. So in this case, uh, the patient has drug-resistant TB, and then treatment for drug-resistant TB is longer and more complex. So the course of TB drugs is provided to the patient with information, supervision, and support by a health worker or a trained volunteer. So without such support, treatment adherence can be difficult. If the treatment is not properly completed, the disease can become drug resistant and can spread. In um, in the case of TB infection, so where the patient is infect infected with TB bacteria but not ill, so TB preventive treatment can be given to stop the onset of disease. So for our MDR-TB, so this is uh, resistant to our rifampicin and isoniazid. We also have this XDRTB. So MDRTB drugs plus they are also resistant to the second line TB drugs and as well as our fluoroquinolone. So how are we going to prevent of being infected by our MTB? So Bacille Calmitguerin or BCG is a vaccine for tuberculosis or TB disease. So this vaccine is not widely used in the United States. However, it is often given to infants and uh, small children in other countries where TB is common. BCG does not always protect uh, people from getting TB. Uh, BCG vaccination should only be considered for children who have a negative TB test and who are continually exposed and cannot be separated from adults who are untreated or ineffectively treated for TB disease. And the child cannot be given long-term primary preventive treatment for TB infection or have isoniazid and rifampin uh, resistant strains of our TB disease. As for our laboratory diagnosis, so there are two kinds of tests used to detect TB bacteria in the body. So the first one is the TB skin test and the second one is our TB blood tests. So a positive TB skin test or TB blood test only tells that a person has been infected with TB bacteria. It does not tell whether the person has latent TB infection or has progressed to TB disease. Other tests such as chest x-ray and a sample of sputum are needed to see whether the person has TB disease. And then the TB skin test or the tuberculin test is also called the manto tuberculin skin test. And then the TB skin test is performed by injecting a small amount of fluid 
called tuberculin into the skin on the lower part of the arm. And then a person given the tuberculin skin test must return within 48 to 72 hours to have a trained healthcare worker uh, look for a reaction on the arm. So the result depends on the size of the wrist or the hard area or the swelling of the arm. So positive skin test, uh, this means that uh, the person's body was infected with TB bacteria and then uh, additional tests are needed to determine if the person has latent TB infection or TB disease and then the negative skin test, so this means that the person's body did not react to the test in that uh, latent TB infection or location on the body, uh, the TB skin test is the preferred TB test for children under the age of 5. So the reagent used for our manto test uh, the standard dose is 0.1 ml of our PPD or our purified protein derivatives or 5 tuberculin units. And then as what I have mentioned earlier, so the positive reaction for our skin test is the erythema and hardening of the site of invex injection, usually 10 millimeters. You are going to measure that one. And if you are not going to perform this tuberculin test or the manto test, so you can also perform the von Perquet test, the Volmer's patches, patch test, and our mural percutaneous test or the tuberculin time test. As for the specimen, so specimens received by the laboratory for mycobacterial smear and culture uh, must be handled in a safe manner. So tuberculosis uh, ranks high among laboratory acquired infections. Um, therefore, laboratory and hospital administrators must provide laboratory personnel with facilities, equipment, and supplies that reduce the risk to a minimum. So for diagnostic purposes, all persons suspected of having TB disease at any site should have sputum collected for TB culture. So at least two consecutive sputum specimens are needed. And then uh, each collected in one hour intervals with at least one uh, being an early morning specimen. So if ever sputum is not available, you can also have other acceptable specimens for processing. So you have respiratory specimens, body fluids, and body tissues. So it was also enumerated in the... Uh, figure on the left so of uh, what are the specific uh, specimens for each of those categories so you can also use that one next we have this uh, decontamination and digestion so um, first we are going to use our sodium hydroxide so the usual concentration is 2 to 4 percent and it serves as a digestant or mucolytic and a decontaminating uh, agent so the second one is our N-acetyl L-cysteine or dithiothretol as a mucolytic agent with 4% sodium hydroxide which is the decontaminating agent. So this is the recommended technique in order to decontaminate and digest our sputum. And lastly, we also have your zephyran or the benzalkonium chloride plus our trisodium phosphate. So um, our Trisodium phosphate liquefies the sputum rapidly but it requires a long exposure time to decontaminate. While the function of our zephyran, uh, it shortens the exposure time. So that's why so these two should be used uh, to decontam and uh, digest our sputum. Now we also have the staining techniques. So the classic carbofusion stain or the Zeal Nielsen uh, requires heating of the slide for better penetration of the stain into the mycobacterial cell wall. Hence, uh, it is also known as the hot stain procedure. So as it was already discussed in our laboratory session and it, this was also performed during our uh, laboratory session. So with zeal-nielsen staining, so mycobacterium species appear red or have a red-blue beaded appearance and then whereas non-mycobacteria appear blue, it's because of the secondary stain, methylene blue. So the quinone acid fast stain uh, it is similar to our Zeal Nielsen staining but no heat is used. This technique uh, is known as the cold stain procedure. So if present, typical acid fast bacilli appear as purple to red and then they are slightly curved or short and long rods. So usually 2 to 8 millimeters in size. And they also may appear beaded or banded you know, such as our Mycobacterium kansasi or kansasi eye. So for some non-tuberculous species such as uh, Mycobacterium avium complex, they appear uh, pleomorphic and they are usually cocoid. Next, um, for in preparation of our uh, sputum smear technique for microscopy, so the smear size is 2 by 3 centimeters. So this, this is somehow a review to all of you. And then you are going to read at 300 fields under oil immersion objective. So you are going to count 
those uh, different EFB no uh, on your uh, EFB smear in every field you're going to count that one and then gram stain uh, qualify specimen if acceptable so that's why we have this Bartlett's criteria in which uh, a sputum specimen should have uh, at least less than 10 epithelial cells and greater than 25 polymorphonuclear cells. So how are we going to report those uh, AFB you have read? So according to the National Standard Reporting Scale, so if there are no AFB seen in 300 fields, so you are going to report it as zero. So if you have seen 1 to 9 AFB per 100 fields, so that's plus N. So, 10 to 99 EFB per 100 fields, so you're going to report it as plus 1. And then, 1 to 10 EFB in at least 50 fields, so you're going to report it as 2 plus. And lastly, if more than 10 EFB in at least 20 fields, you're going to report that as 3 plus. Next, we proceed to the culture and culture media for our MTB. So, we have this uh, agar-based, so serum albumin agar media, so we have two. We have the Middlebrook 7H11 and our Michison Selective 7H11. Our Middlebrook 7H11 consists of 0.1% casein hydrolysate and the purpose of this Middlebrook 7H11 is to improve the recovery of our isoniacid-resistant MTB. And we also have our liquid media. So our liquid media, uh, our mycobacterium species will grow more rapidly in the liquid medium and it can be used for both primary isolation and subculturing. So our Bactec 12B medium, this is used in our MGIT 960 system. So the panta is added before incubation and then the C-labeled palmitic acid is metabolized to produce carbon dioxide which is detected by the instrument or by our machine. We also have your Middlebrook 7H9 broth and Middlebrook 7H13. So you're going to use Middlebrook Middlebrook uh, 7H9 broth for aseptically collected specimens and uh, Middlebrook 7H13 for larger volumes of bone marrow or our blood specimens. We also have egg-based culture media. So Literally, so the source of our lipid is from the egg yolk. That's why it is uh, called as such. And we also have uh, malachite green in order to inhibit the growth of other contaminants. So we have your Petraniani. So Petraniani medium, it contains twice the concentration of malachite than your uh, LJ or Lewinstein Jensen medium. So it is an inhibitor of our contaminating organisms as what I have mentioned earlier. So, Pietraniani, it improves recovery from heavily contaminated specimens. And we also have your Lowenstein Jensen so it, or LJ medium. This is the most commonly used culture media for our MTB. And lastly, we also have your ATS or our American Thoracic Society medium. So, as for the colonies of our MTB under your LJ slants, so the colonies of our MTB so are typically raised and then they are dry and then they also have a rough appearance. And please remember this one, everyone, that our MTB, uh, they have this so-called a breadcrumb appearance. While our mycobacterium avium complex, on the other hand, so they have this so-called uh, condom colony appearance. So that's the difference of this uh, two mycobacterium species in terms of their morphology of the colony. Next, uh, we also have our biochemical test. So first is the niacin accumulation test. So once categorized into a preliminary subgroup based, based on its growth characteristics, an organism must be definitively identified to species or complex level. So one of which is our niacin or the nicotinic acid. So it plays an important role in the oxidation reduction reactions that, uh, that occur during mycobacterial metabolism. Although all species produce nicotinic acid, mycobacterium tuberculosis accumulates the largest amount. Mycobacterium simiae and some strains of mycobacterium chilinae also produce niacin. So as for the principle, so we have this uh, niacin and uh, plus our cyanogen bromide reagent plus our amine, it will produce a yellow pigmented compound. So that's why uh, the positive result for our niacin test is a yellow pigmentation or yellow compound on our uh, test test tube so as you can see on the figure or in the picture it's on the right so of course the negative reaction will remain colorless or no color change at all
Next, we also have our uh, nitrate reduction test. So, a nitrate reduction test is valuable for identifying Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Mycobacterium kansasi or kansasi I, Mycobacterium zulgai, and our Mycobacterium fortuitum. So, the ability of acid fast bacilli to reduce nitrate is influenced by the age of the colonies. So, temperature, pH, and enzyme inhibitors. Although rapid growers can be tested within 2 weeks, so slow growers should be tested after 3 to 4 weeks of our luxuriant growth. So, positive result is seen on these uh, organisms, our Mycobacterium kansasi or kansasi I, Mycobacterium zulgai, Mycobacterium fortuitum, and our Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So, as you can see on the picture, so we have a 1 plus reaction. So, it's somehow uh, light pink, and then 3 plus, it is pink, and then 5 plus, is somehow dark pink. So, the control tube, so it's, it remains clear. There is no color change at all. Next, we also have, I know that you're familiar with this one, the catalase test. So, most species of mycobacteria, except for certain strains of mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, some isoniazid resistant strains and our mycobacterium gastri, produce the intracellular enzyme catalase, so which splits hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. And then, catalase can be assessed by using the semi-quantitative catalase test or the heat-stable catalase test. The semi-quantitative catalase test is based on the relative activity of the enzyme, and as determined by the height of a column of bubbles of oxygen formed by the action of untreated enzyme produced by the organism. So based on the semi-quantitative catalase test, uh, mycobacteria are divided into two groups, those that produce uh, less than 45 millimeters of uh, bubbles and uh, those that produce more than 45 millimeters of bubbles, as you can see on our uh, picture. So, of course, the control tube uh, doesn't have any effervescence or bubble formation at all. Next, we have our twin AT hydrolysis test. So, the commonly non-pathogenic slow-growing scotochromogens and non-photochromogens produce a phase that can hydrolyze twin AT. Twin AT is the detergent of our uh, polyoxoethylene sorbitan monoolate into oleic acid and polyoxyethylated uh, sorbitol. Whereas uh, pathogenic species do not uh, do not uh, do not produce that uh, end product, and then twin AT hydrolysis is useful for differentiating species of our photochromogens, non-chromogens, and scotochromogens, which we are going to discuss uh, later on this uh, lesson. And then we have the arisulfatase test. So the enzyme arisulfatase is present in most mycobacteria. Test conditions can be varied to distinguish the different forms of the enzyme. And then the rate at which the enzyme breaks down phenolphthalein disulfate into phenolphthalein, which forms a red color in the presence of sodium bicarbonate. And then uh, other salts helps to differentiate uh, certain strains of mycobacteria. So the 3 day test is particularly useful for identifying the potentially pathogenic rapid growers such as our Mycobacterium fortuitum and our Mycobacterium chelonii or the Mycobacterium fortuitum chelonii complex. And then slow growing Mycobacterium marinum and Mycobacterium zulgai are positive also in our arisulfatase test using the 14 day test. So negative organisms are our uh, Mycobacterium evium complex and our Mycobacterium tuberculosis for this test. So we have here a summary of the various biochemical tests that you can use or perform in order to differentiate the various Mycobacterium species or the Mycobacterium group. <laughs> now let's proceed to our next organism. So we have our Mycobacterium bovis. Mycobacterium bovis or M. bovis is another Mycobacterium that can cause TB disease in people and uh, M. bovis is most commonly found in cattle and other animals such as bison, elk, and deer. In people, uh, M. bovis causes TB disease that can affect the lungs, lymph nodes, and other parts of the body. However, as with M. tuberculosis, not everyone infected with M. bovis becomes sick. People are most commonly infected with M. bovis by eating or drinking contaminated and pasteurized dairy products. The pasteurization process, which destroys uh, disease-causing organisms in milk by rapidly heating and then cooling the milk, eliminates M. bovis from milk products. Infection can also occur from direct contact with a wound, such as what might occur during slaughter or hunting, or 
by inhaling the bacteria in air uh, exhaled by animals infected with MBOVs. Direct transmission from animals to humans through the air is, through, uh, is thought to be rare, but MBOVs can be spread directly from person to person when people with a disease in their lungs uh, cough or sneeze. Next, we have our Mycobacterium leprae. Uh, the non-tuberculous Mycobacterium M. leprae is a close relative of M. tuberculosis. This organism causes leprosy, also called Hansen disease. Uh, leprosy is a chronic disease of the skin, mucous membranes, and the nerve tissue. So, leprosy remains a worldwide public health concern as a result of the development of drug-resistant isolates. So, Hansen disease is not uh, considered highly contagious, but there are two major forms. So, first is our tuberculoid leprosy, uh, in which the symptoms of our tuberculoid leprosy include skin lesions and nerve involvement. And then, on the other hand, our lepromatous leprosy, these are also characterized by skin lesions and progressive symmetric nerve damage and do not produce an effective uh, cell-mediated immune response. For the laboratory diagnosis of our Mycobacterium leprae, so we can perform or we can use lepromine test. So this is a skin test consisting of a heat-killed suspension of our M. leprae prepared from lepromatous nodules. So there are two types of reaction upon performing this test. So you have the early Fernandez reaction and the late Matsuda reaction. So for the early Fernandez reaction, induration of the skin appears uh, 24 to 48 hours while late Mitsuda reaction so from the word itself so it's induration of the nodules develops after 3 to 4 weeks so for our cultivation so our Mycobacterium leprae has not yet been uh, cultivated in vitro although it can be cultivated in the armadillo and in the foot pads of mice so molecular biologic techniques have provided uh, most of the information about this organism's genomic structure and its various genes and their products. Polymerase chain reaction or PCR assays have been uh, used to detect and identify our M. leprae in infective, infected uh, tissues. Next, we are going to classify the various mycobacterium group or our mycobacterium species according to Runyon's classification. So first, we have the photochromogen. So uh, only those non-tuberculous uh, mycobacterium are classified under our uh, Runyon's classification. So we have uh, the photochromogens or the group 1. So the NTM colonies that develop pigment on exposure to light after being grown in the dark and it will take longer than 7 days to appear on a solid media. So, as what you have seen on the picture on the left side or the box, so kindly familiarize those uh, organisms that belongs to our non-chromogens, to our photochromogens, our scotochromogens, and as well as uh, the sub-classification such as slow growers or rapid growers under the box on the left side. So I want you to remember also that uh, Mycobacterium kansasi or kansasi I is also known as your yellow bacillus and Mycobacterium marino, so it means of the sea, it is the agent of the swimming pool granuloma. Next group, we have uh, scotochromogens or group 2. So these are organisms or NTM colonies that develop pigment in the dark or light and take longer than 7 days to appear on a solid media. I want you to remember that Mycobacterium sinopi, so the colonies, the branching colonies, are described as uh, beards, bird's nest. And then Mycobacterium gordonii is also known as your top water bacillus. Next, we have our group 3 or the non-photochromogens or the non-photochromogenic group. So the NTM colonies that are uh, non-pigmented uh, regardless of whether they are grown in the dark or light and take longer than 7 days to appear on solid media. So our M. tuberculosis uh, belongs on the non-photochromogens or the non-chromogens. 
So, please remember also this one that your amoebium intracellular complex, it is otherwise known as your pate bacillus and our mycobacterium terrae is also known as your radish bacillus. So, rapid growing mycobacteria in which growth is apparent sooner than 7 days after subculture to Lewinstein, Jensen, Midew may partially or completely lo uh, lose this characteristic as a result of their growth characteristics. Slow growing mycobacteria, by definition, require more than 7 days to produce colonies on solid media, and then the variation in generation times among the mycobacteria results in the formation of visible colonies in 2 to uh, 60 days at an optimum temperature. So our mycobacterium fortuitum chelonae complex, they grow on maconchi agar without crystal violet, and that is our modified maconchi agar. So as you can see on the picture on the right, And that ends for our lesson for our mycobacterium group. I hope that you have learned something on this video. So as for the references used, so it was already flashed on your screen. And once again, thank you so much everyone. So for questions or clarifications, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you so much. Have a good day.